Okay, thank you very much. So, um, this afternoon, it's going to be uh, a bit more geochemistry, so uh, a bit more, maybe in people's uh, comfort zone. So, I'm going to talk about uh, mineral dust and also the ability of mineral dust to produce uh, ice clouds. So, because this is something that's uh, very poorly quantified uh, in atmospheric models, and it's, we're currently at the stage where uh, the IPCC doesn't include uh, any sections on um, ice nucleating uh, particles uh, in the report, but they appreciate that they need to for the next one. So um, when the IPCC um, start paying attention to it, we must be doing um, something right. So, um, so what exactly, when we say a speck of dust, so dust to some people, dust to your mother... It's probably very different to what uh, we're going to talk about today. So, but I saw this graphic, and this is so it's a speck of dust is halfway between this and this, and the sort of data geek, the scientist in me said, "Is it, is that true?" I wanted to prove it to myself. So now that that's that's household dust. That's the dust your mother's uh, is concerned about. So. I did a, a little bit of maths, so atomic diameter, the Earth. So halfway between that and that is about 500 microns, and that is exactly, or oh, that's close enough for a speck of dust to be that. But that size particle of dust in the air doesn't stay in the air very long. It drops out quite quickly. When we're talking about mineral dust, we're talking about things that are maybe a hundred times smaller than that, so maybe five microns. Um, and five microns is big enough to stay up in the air for quite uh, some time. The smaller a particle gets, the longer it stays in the atmosphere. The lifetime of the uh, that particle uh, increases. In the same way, uh, as I said to some people this morning, if you go to the beach and pick up a handful of sand, you throw it in the air, the wind's blowing in that direction, the smaller the particle, the further it goes that way because it's just falling out of, just falling out of the air slower. So when we talk about mineral dust, mineral dust is just an example of what we call uh, an aerosol. And aerosols are anything from soot. So this is what comes out of the back of cars, out of the back, top of chimneys. And that's, that starts from uh, gases being converted into particles. So these sorts of Aerosols grow from gases going, uh, getting bigger and bigger until they condense to be uh, solids or liquids aerosols. Whereas mineral dust, for example, and we can see here, this is, this is a mineral dust outbreak off the coast of Africa. So this is the Canary Islands here, and this is the mineral dust um, actually being lofted from the Sahara. So that's much, much uh, bigger than these primary particles, um, so they last for uh, their their formation is due to attrition, so things banging against each other, which we'll see uh, later on. And with, we're concerned about aerosols from many different perspectives, but from the air quality perspective, we think about how far they can actually penetrate into the into the human body. So. The smaller the particle, the deeper it will get into your body. So these tiny particles will actually transport uh, chemicals and toxins into your bloodstream. They pass through cell membranes. Saharan dust, mineral dust, does not. It gets trapped sort of in this sort of area. You're still ingesting um, the aerosols, but they're not travelling through uh, cell membranes or anything like that. So the human body is providing some level of protection there. And where does mineral dust come from? So, and, and the amount of mineral dust that's available to be le uh, lofted is actually increasing as we perturb the natural environment more and more. So land use change, uh, land degradation, overgrazing areas, um, cutting down uh, forested areas so they're more exposed and... Uh, more prone to erosion will generate more and more mineral dust being lofted um, into the atmosphere 
as you can probably guess, a lot of the mineral dust region, rich regions are sort of the more dry and arid ones. There's a particular hot spot here which is called um, the Bedaly Depression. So that's an old uh, paleo lake in Chad and that is a, a phenomenal source of mineral dust. You can see it in a, many satellite images. You can see a, a streak from that. We can also see uh, the central Sahara and then the Gobi Desert and central Australia uh, and the Patagonian highlands are all very uh, significant sources of mineral dust. So, and we care about mineral dust because this is the, the IPCC uh, radiative uh, forcings chart. So it has carbon dioxide. These are the gases that we understand quite a lot about. You can see that the level of uncertainty is relatively small here because we understand the science that governs them in the atmosphere. But what we're thinking about here is aerosols. And you can see that this is the, the zero line. So anything in that direction is warming the atmosphere. Anything in this direction is cooling the atmosphere. So the aerosols, there's a range of different aerosols. We have mineral dust, which we're going to talk about today. So that has a net cooling effect on the atmosphere, generally because it's just scattering light back out to space. On the other hand, black carbon in the atmosphere warms. So it will absorb um, radiation, infrared radiation, and in doing so will warm the atmosphere. But if you look carefully on this, you can see the level of uncertainty here is quite significant. So the level of uncertainty says we just need to understand more. We need to do more research on this. And it, although it's obscured, if you just look here, this is cloud, aerosol cloud interactions. And again, clouds will cool the atmosphere. But the science of how aerosols and clouds interact is, again, is something that we don't fully understand. We need to understand uh, more. So you can see there's, again, there's a large uh, uncertainty associated with that. And if we remember back to here, so we have um, the direct effect, solar radiation, either being scattered back out to space or being absorbed and then re-radiated. And then we have the effect of aerosols on clouds. So as you put more aerosols into clouds, the cloud droplets will get smaller because they're producing what are called cloud condensation um, nuclei. So just quickly on how mineral dust aerosol is produced in the atmosphere because we start off if we just get rocks and we just keep banging them uh, together, just basically attrition, you're going to get to a certain point where <coughs> the rocks or the, the particles, if you bang them together, they simply do not have enough momentum. So if I started with a large rock and threw it against that wall, small bits of rock would keep chipping off until it got to the point where I've, if I threw it at the wall, it's so small it doesn't have any momentum, no inertia, so it would just bounce off. So they get to a finite minimum um, size. So that's how uh, they form and get suspended into the um, atmosphere. And one of the major ways that they do get lofted into the atmosphere is a, a process called a haboob. So this is... Um, a storm cloud, and what's happened is as the rain falls down through the cloud, and as it falls down through the cloud, the water droplets start to evaporate. But in evaporating, they cool down the air around them. There's an exchange of latent energy, and that will push out this gust front here, which will lift up any mineral dust in its way. Now, traditionally, people thought this sort of thing only happens in deserts, places like Africa. But it happens across Australia. You get this happening also um, in the dry uh, Midwest in America. This is, I think this is Australia. Um, this picture happens in the Middle East as well. This is a more traditional view that people see. So this is a, a wall. So this is from the ground but it's exactly the same. You see the clouds, the white clouds above. So this is just normal uh, water clouds. And then we have this big front of dust coming forward.
forwards. So, um, and this is quite a regular occurrence because this farmer here and the goats don't seem too concerned about it. So it's not something, you know, it's something they, he, the, something I suspect that farmer's seen before. He's bringing the goats in, but he's not, he's not terrified of it. It's not like he doesn't know what it is. So if we put this, now we've rotated this. So again, this is, um, this is the coast of Africa and this is the Cape Verde Islands we're looking at now. So a north is in this direction. So, and this is a cross section along this line is a line that a satellite's looking down. So starting from this end, this is the view looking down, cross section through the atmosphere. And you can see this dust plume, which is what we can see here. And you can see it gets thicker where it looks visually thicker. So this is exactly what this is. So the satellite is looking down here in the same way that you're looking down at that. And we can see the low clouds as well, which you can, you can see along this line as well. And then the high clouds, we can see there's some high cloud here as well, and that's showing up here. So, but that is, that is changing the albedo of the surface that the, 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 the sun, the photons that are coming down, are looking at. So you'll see that the overall effect, if we, we've got a look at the sunlight coming down along this line, there is less sunlight reaching this part of the ocean compared to this part of the ocean. So you would expect that part of the ocean not to be quite as warm. And now we've rotated, this is, a, this is a different time, but it's showing the same feature. So now we've got the coast of Africa here. We've got Spain going up to the UK, America, Caribbean, South America. And this is now looking at the sea surface temperature. So this is showing the, anom the anomaly from the average temperature here. And it's just showing the differences between the average temperature and the actual temperature, the anomaly. And you can see... Here, Cape Verde again, that sort of region, which is where a lot of the um, mineral dust explosions, storms are driven out of Africa. And we can see that this region is an awful lot cooler, nearly four degrees cooler um, than other areas of the Atlantic. So you can see the effect that mineral dust is having. It's just a parasol over the ocean to stop the sea surface temperature from increasing. Again, this is, this is not uh, a satellite image, you can see. This is, so this is a model output, this is a forecast model, and it's just showing the transport of dust across uh, the Atlantic over the Caribbean. And one important factor about when this dust does go over the Caribbean is it stops the sea surface from increase, temperature from increasing too much. Because when hurricanes, and hurricanes are born out of African storms, they come across the Atlantic, and when they get to here, the very warm waters of the Caribbean, that's where they get all their, uh, their energy from. The intensity is driven by just how warm this water is. So the cooler this water is, the less intense the hurricanes are. So, and you can, you can see, when there's a big, when there's a summer that features a lot of dust storms that get all the way to the Caribbean, the level of hurricanes is usually much lower. So which all makes perfect sense when we think about it. This is, but the, the dust outbreaks don't always go straight across the Atlantic. This is a dust outbreak that went north. So we can see Mediterranean, Greece is up here, and it's blowing in this direction. We've got Romania, Moldova, Ukraine, and this is Sochi, the Russian ski resort, with Saharan dust, on the snow. So, and it doesn't seem to be putting these people off. You know, they've gone right the Saharan dust on the snow, they're still out skiing. And you can see this, this is the outbreak as it's going north. So this is the high levels of dust. So, so it doesn't always go straight across the Atlantic. It's governed by the weather. Um, So, and this is a really nice um, video that NASA have put together. So this is 2017. This is real data.
This is desert dust. Wildfires. And you can see these hurricanes moving across. You see the continuous stream of dust that keeps coming across. And then smoke going all the way up to Greenland and going north. And then in October there was a strand of Saharan dust that came up towards the UK, which we'll see in a minute. So Ophelia was a storm that came up towards the UK but it squashed the Saharan dust. You see that big plume that went over the UK and the fires there. Now the, the fires were quite um, surprising because um, what happened was the fires were in Portugal but in the UK, there were reports that people could smell the fires. Now, when I first heard that, I said, someone in the UK can smell a fire, doesn't matter how big it is, in Portugal. But then if you analyse the weather charts, the atmosphere was very compressed, so it kept the smoke in this very narrow stream because Ophelia squashed it in from one side. So, and then I spoke to a, a colleague who was in Wales and he said he could smell it. So it wasn't just press reports, it was someone I knew and believed. So the smell of forest fires in Portugal got all the way uh, to the UK. That does also suggest how big a fire um, they must have been. So when we go uh, and flying around in the aircraft, we'll look at uh, layers in the atmosphere so we can fly up through the atmosphere. In the same way if you're doing a core you might go down into the ground and look at uh, different levels in the ground. So what we've got here is what we call vertical profiles and here we get making a, a, a measurement that's just measuring the scattering at three different wavelengths of uh, driven by particles in the sample. So this is the scattering coefficient, so more scattering in that direction. So there's high scattering there and low scattering here. And this is the, the height in the atmosphere, so starting from, from the surface, uh, this is sea level, up to 5,000 metres. And what we've got here is we've got a number of different layers of different concentrations. And the important thing to look at the difference between this panel and this panel is that this is biomass burning. Remember biomass burning, so combustion is very small particles. And the smaller particles will scatter uh, the blue wavelength of light more than they scatter the red because they interact, they're full, uh, more fine tuned to that. Whereas the dust, because it's bigger, will be scattering the reds and the greens over the blue. So you can see that basically the, this scattering profile is telling you whether it's dust or the biomass, the smoke aerosol. And we can see the dust, and as we'd expect, because the dust particles are bigger, than the smoke, and the smoke when it's produced is warm. So that tends to get higher than the dust particles. And if we look at now the size distribution, so this is the radius of the particles, biomass, smoke, we can see the dust there, that there actually is larger particles compared to the biomass smoke. Again, this is making sense. So we're making the observations and we're looking, and these are all tying together. So obviously this is just in the aircraft but we can look at satellite photos, we can get measurements from the ground as well. So we've looked at the direct scattering, uh, direct effect, now we're going to think about the indirect effect. So the things that go and produce, um, interact with water vapour in the atmosphere, water and water vapour, uh, and produce clouds. So some very basic school 
level stuff. So how exactly does a cloud form? So it's normally driven by, you have warm air at the surface. If it rises up um, to higher elevations, it's going to cool down, so we get condensation. That's clouds forming, just like breathing on a cold mirror or uh, condensation forming on the um, window. So, but we, sometimes we need to help that um, along. So we need another ingredient, and we refer to this as a cloud condensation nuclei. Now, I could go on and do an entire atmospheric physics lecture all about it, or I can use someone's cup of tea to demonstrate this. So this is quite common practice if you're on uh, a ship in the Arctic, because the Arctic is very, very clean air, pristine air. So if you look carefully, that is a cup of tea, boiling water, and you can't see any steam from it initially. So no steam, you can't see any droplets. But when we introduce a source of CCN, pollution, cigarette, this is producing the CCN, the cloud condensation nuclei, and that is a site for water vapour to condense on. So this is how the clouds are actually forming. So we're getting CCN. So without CCN, you get very, very low concentrations of water droplets. Like This is why you see uh, generally very, very clear skies in regions like the Arctic and places like that. But higher up in the atmosphere, where it is very, very cold, water can exist in a supercooled state. So liquid water can remain as liquid down to temperatures as low as minus 38 degrees. So you may have, when you went to school, the freezing temperature of water is zero. That was what you were taught. But that's really the melting temperature of water. Because you can do this experiment yourself. You get mineral water and you put it into the freezer, cool it down to minus 10, it can still be a liquid inside the bottle. But if you bang the bottle, if you hit it on a desk, a percussion wave can set off uh, the freezing. Or if you pour it out onto some, uh, onto some dust that you've just swept from the floor, that will then provide a nucleation site and make it freeze. So we can water can stay in this supercooled state. So it means you can get what are called mixed phase clouds. So the clouds can contain both water in liquid uh, an ice form until we get the presence of what we call ice nucleating particles. So these ice nucleating particles are the catalysts for ice to form. And they can be things like silicates, soils, dusts, mineral dust, clays, biology, so fungal spores, uh, some combustion particles will do this as well, and other industrial materials. So there's quite a wide variety of different things that will actually nucleate ice um, in the atmosphere and we need to understand these because these are the sorts of things that we need to be putting into climate models so we can model what's actually happening in the atmosphere because when water changes phase as we've already seen if, if water condenses in the atmosphere the air around it warms up and that's why clouds will stay aloft because the, as the condensation happens the air warms up so that little individual event just goes up in the atmosphere, it uh, rises up through the atmosphere. So when we're looking from a, from a nucleation uh, perspective, there are four different mechanisms for freezing to happen. So freezing is, a, is, is there's more to freezing than just freezing, changing phase. So we could have a contact nucleation freezing event. So this is our ice nucleating particle, and then that will suddenly ca catalyze and the freezing will happen out across this uh, droplet. Immersion freezing is where the particle is actually inside the liquid and then freezing begins. We can get a, uh, in the opposite of sublimation, we can get a deposition nucleation event or homogeneous freezing. And that's where actually doesn't need any help, any catalyst, any IMP to happen. But homogeneous freezing in ultra-pure water happens at very low temperatures. It starts happening about minus 33. So we need to understand these 
So clouds between zero and about minus 37 can be uh, mixed phase and they're very, very sensitive to the presence of these ice nucleating particles. Now, just to help things make things a bit easier, they're in incredibly low concentrations. So if we're talking about aerosol particles, and think about the concentration of those, basically one in a million of those will probably be an INP. So we're, we're, we're talking very, very low concentrations. But they are very effective when they're present because they will take these water droplets and they will scavenge the water and turn them into and grow into an ice particle, which will then, as it gets to a certain size, will start to drop out the atmosphere. And these ice particles, especially in tropical storms, they will fall through, the air will get warmer as it gets close to the surface, obviously. So they will talk, they, this will turn into uh, raindrops. So most tropical storms, if they start up high in, in the atmosphere, will start off as ice and there'll be water by the time they hit the surface. And one example that has, has always uh, surprised people is what are called hole punch clouds or fall streak clouds. So you get this, this sort of flat deck um, of stratus clouds. And what will happen is quite often you get them near airports. So an aircraft will actually fly through this and in doing so it will produce or emit some ice nucleating particles and they will suddenly scavenge all the water droplets to such a size that they'll just, the water droplets will become large ice crystals and they will fall out of this. So that's why we get this, this hole forming in that. But until they understand and people don't know what these are, they think it's some sort of alien event or something like that. People will always look for some sort of conspiracy um, theory, but uh, they're a, a, a very nice example. So one of the big uh, challenges is the concentration. So I said that uh, IMP are in much, much lower concentrations. They're all, also very sensitive. So anything you're doing has to be very, very clean. So how do we actually go about measuring ice nucleating particles? And it doesn't actually re uh, require any large, significant instrumentation. So if we remember back to um, the airship and... So I was the chemist, we have an entomologist, someone studying insects, uh, a biologist, uh, a meteorologist, and um, we also had a skydiver. He was uh, ex-military, so if we want to do sampling in the atmosphere, we just throw him out of an aeroplane with instruments strapped to him. So he likes that sort of thing. So, but because it was for um, television, they were trying to make, you know, they, they put a bit of a, a competitive element, and Chris, uh, who's the... the uh, the biologist in this, he's done quite, he does quite a lot of television. So when they said, right then, you're going to challenge each other. So the biology, which is best at making clouds, the biology or the chemistry? They said, pull your really serious science face. And that's a serious science face for someone who does a lot of television. And that's a serious science face for, from, uh, from me, which is not uh, particularly convincing. You know, he looks very serious, very questioning, and he just looks like a bit of an idiot. So, <clears throat> so this is our experiment. This is uh, equipment that we took from Leeds out with us. So uh, it's fairly simple uh, technique. It just requires everything to be um, nice and clean when we're doing this. So we take our water droplets, and this is just for demonstration. We take the water droplets um, and we pipette them onto a glass slide. This is a very clean glass slide and ultra clean water. And this is on a cold stage, so we simply just cool it down slowly and we video it. And that's it. We just get a webcam, the you know, 50 euro webcam, and film it and look at the temperature that these droplets are going to freeze. So, and what we did for the, just, to, just to make it nice and simple, so this is our slide. And we've got three lines of water droplets. That's pure water. This is water containing mineral dust. So we just put some mineral dust in it and shake it up. And this is bacteria. So has anybody been, who's been skiing in this room? So, and you know when they make artificial snow? When they make artificial snow, they put bacteria in the snow. 
It's called Snowmax. It's, uh, it's, it's been deactivated, so it is safe. You know, you can't go squirting bacteria around. The thing about it is it's fantastically good at making, making water freeze. So that's what we've got here. So this bacteria, and you can buy it. Um, this is mineral dust and this is pure water. So we're going to cool them down and just compare. Oops. You should talk to us. So that's the water. This is mineral dust. And the whole plate's at the same temperature. Okay, so we've seen that actually he won, because biology is better, but they're in much, much lower concentration than mineral dust. So, but that was just a, a demonstration of how uh, the technique works. So we took this technique uh, to Cape Verde. We've already, if you remember back your geography lesson, I won't ask anybody up, but Cape Verde is off the west coast of Africa. Lots of dust coming out of here. So we go to field projects where we expect dust to happen. We were taking samples from our research aircraft and we also had a, a weather radar here. So this can send images so we can, we can look where the clouds are and we can send images of where the cloud are to the aircraft, the cloud we can tell the aircraft where to fly to. So this is the aircraft itself, it's a converted uh, city jet, normally about have about 120 seats inside it, we take all the seats out and put instrument racks in and things like that, so it's, it is a flying laboratory for all, all intents and purposes. Lots of things hanging in off the side including these two inlets, so these allow us to take air from outside and just suck them through uh, polycarbonate filters, nothing more than a 47 mil polycarbonate filter. This is the filter holder inside uh, the aircraft itself. So it's connected through, th through that skin and comes through here. And we can see this is the filter uh, holders that we've got. So we just put a filter across this. Again, another representation of our, uh, the imaging equipment. And what we've got here is it actually doesn't need a particularly fancy instrument to see that we've collected some Saharan dust on here because if you look carefully there's yellow dust on these and you can see these are these are sequential images and we can see that they are these are all unfrozen and you can suddenly see that they start to freeze and then they're all frozen there so it's a fairly simple technique it does take a little bit of setup so a uh, when, when we go on uh, field work, we don't always get a normal laboratory. So this is a, this is a conference room at the hotel um, that we've set up our uh, laboratory. It's quite difficult to get a clean environment because uh, in Cape Verde, everything's dusty all the time. So we have to spend quite a lot of time uh, cleaning and actually making sure that we've got reasonable what we call our blanks. So your first measurement of the day, you don't use one of your va valuable samples because we only get four or five samples per flight. So we just do some mineral water uh, or milliQ water samples. And these are blanks and you can see that over, this is the blanks for about a week. And the first one of the day is always not as good as uh, the second one of the day because you just have to get this, you have to spend time getting the system nice and clean. So these are these are good blanks and these are not so good blanks. So we don't start actually doing anything with the instrument until we know that we're getting uh, a good blank because we've, sp we've spent a considerable amount of time and effort getting those samples. So that's our, that's our good blanks. And what we've got here is temperatures. So this is showing the temperature. This is from zero down to minus 40. So we're expecting all the water to have frozen by about minus um, 35 because it, it, it is incredibly difficult to get ultra-pure, particle-free water. So we buy very clean water and then we filter it several times to get it to this stage. And this is the fraction frozen, so that's no non -drop frozen, 10%, 20%, all the way up to 100% of the droplets are all frozen. So all we do is record 
what, what temperature each droplet freezes. And that's what we get here. So what we can see is the blanks are here and all the samples are well away from the blanks. There's a lot of, I guess you could say, real estate between the real samples and the blanks. So the real samples are real, which is good. You don't want, you don't want to be taking uh, you know, a big sample from off the coast of Africa and end up with them falling in here. So we can see um, we've got a lot of different uh, levels of activity or concentration of our IMP. And they all follow the same line. So they all start to, you get these random events starting off early on. It's a Poisson distribution generally. And then you suddenly get a, over quite a short range of uh, temperatures, they suddenly all go very, very quickly and then they sort of tail off. So this is, the, this is the traditional line that we're seeing. You see that, but not quite to the same sharp extent as we're doing here. So you, we end up with this concept of things freezing at a warmer temperature, which is slightly not, not quite intuitive. But uh, if, if you talk about it enough, it sort of starts to make sense. So anything at this end is a much more effective ice nucleating particle because it doesn't have to be quite so cold for it to freeze if that makes sense. Does that make sense? So then we think about it in comparison to where the airs actually come from. So and what we've got here is we've got our flight tracks in here. So these are the flight numbers and we can see all the different places that the airs come from. So we take a, a particular location in space, a particular time and location in, in space and then we wind back the clock to see where the airs come from. And this is the same way that you know, a lot of the uh, initial analysis of uh, the Chernobyl plume was done using exactly the same technique. Fukushima, you know, and a lot of you know, looking at uh, pollution tracking, we just use these back trajectories. So we, we, we know where we are, and then we just wind back the clock. We just run a model, a forecast model backwards, so we can see where the airs come from. And you can see that we have a wide variety of different types of air come from different regions and we've got a, a good spread of results here which sort of makes sense. If you've got air from lots of different places you'd, ex you'd expect those lines not all to sit on top of each other. Again, you know, this is, this is good, you know, it gives us something to um, go at. It's always nice to check uh, your measurements. So this is, we've just done a quick test. So this is just looking at the, we've converted it into uh, the IMP uh, concentration per uh, unit volume. And we've, we've looked at two different samples taken uh, on, we have two parallel lines and we run one at a much higher flow rate. And when we correct for that higher flow rate, we get a very similar um, result. So that, that, that's good. That's a, because it's all about adding confidence um, to our measurements. This is, we did a, a long transit up towards the Canaries um, in the same air mass, so the same lump of air in the atmosphere, and we took three different samples, con consecutive samples. So these are about a 10 minute sample followed by a 10 minute sample followed by a 10 minute sample in the same air. So we'd expect, we'd like to see the same concentration, and we've got exactly the same concentration, or that's, you know, that, that's as good a match as we're going to uh, hope with this technique. So again, uh, filter to filter, this is in, diff in, in different samples along the same air mass, and we're saying the same results. And then we can take, if you remember back to this, uh, that scattering uh, measurement showing the different layers in the atmosphere, we can use it as a relatively crude uh, measure for the concentration of uh, mineral dust uh, in the atmosphere. So this is what we're getting here. So this is the lower concentration, the medium concentration, the higher concentration. So the higher the concentration, according to the nephilometer, which is uh, uh, measuring the amount of scattering, the higher the temperature that these start to uh, start, the freezing events are starting. So again, that's all ma making sense. And you can see that these are in much higher concentration along this is a this is log scale now we're moving up and then so that's just measurements off the coast of Africa but what we want to do is think about you know we, we're talking about the whole planet uh, and the potential for IMP around the planet 
So we've got, so this is uh, one of our PhD students, Alberto, um, and this photo is him in uh, Alaska. So we have samples taken in Alaska, Greenland, over the UK and Cape Verde. So, and you can see they're all bunched together. So the Cape Verde ones are the most active ones. So they're going at the warmer uh, temperatures, going all the way down to less and less active. So the Alaskan ones are the, are the mo most, um, the least active uh, as INP uh, particles that we've seen. They're, they're in lower concentrations and they, they freeze at much, much lower temperatures compared to the, the ones that contain uh, mineral dust. And that's sort of what we're expecting because mineral dust is, is seen as to be quite an effective um, ice nucleating particle. But mineral dust initially to me was just mineral dust. But I'm surrounded by uh, earth scientists, geochemists, and I'm sure anybody in here, if I just said, oh, well, it's like a rock is a rock, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's completely incorrect. So what exactly is uh, the mineral dust and what's its composition? So we've discovered that um, potassium feldspar is a particularly effective um, ice nucleating particle. So if we start thinking about the most effective ice nucleating particles and where they exist, then you can start to think where the regions that you'd get more INP coming from. So this is, this is a global abundance of uh, feldspar. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's available to be lifted into the sky. It just means it's there. So we start to put these sorts of things into our uh, models. So this is just showing a variety of different minerals here. So this is the potassium feldspar. As I said, it's a very effective going all the way. To, so the red here, that's homogeneous freezing. That's there, the, there are the sorts of blanks. And then we've got a variety of different uh, minerals going across. So we've got quartz here, we've got mica, um, calcite, uh, and other ones that I can't even start to pronounce. So you, you need some geochemistry training to do that. I can pronounce kaolinite. So, <clears throat> but you can see that mineral dusts, we're looking at some part of the mineral dust is much more effective at being a, uh, an ice nucleating particle than others. So we've got to think about um, that. So we've started looking at electron microscopy. So this is uh, SCM using EDX to do uh, composition. So this is, we've got size distributions here. So this is from uh, 400 nanometers, the bottom of this bin, going up to 14 microns. So we can see that there's a wide variety of different compositions um, present as you, as you change across the different uh, size regimes in the, um, in the mineral, or the, the, they're not mineral dust, this is what we've measured actually on the filter itself. We can see here that applying the same technique to air that is predominantly mineral dust, Icelandic dust and sort of urban air, you can see this is very, very different. So urban air, that's generally, most of the particles are carbonaceous. They've come from fossil fuel combustion, which is what you'd expect. Um, and them to be predominantly, or certainly when you get down to the smaller regions, uh, smaller sizes, they're definitely all carbonaceous. And also here we've got a lot of carbonation material because the mineral dust sort of backs off in concentration as we get down to this region. And then we've got significant aluminosilicate and silicon uh, composition in the, big, in the larger sizes, which is, which is what you'd expect. If we look at quartz, so again, showing my naivety, when someone, you know, in the past when someone said quartz, I say, yeah, quartz. But if I say to this room, quartz, you know, you're thinking about all the different uh, types of quartz that are present and Needless to say, they all have very different activities when we think about them from ice nucleating particles. So this is where, again, working with geochemists uh, and geologists is very, very useful for us to start to unpick um, these sorts of things. And this is a, a computer model um, that one of our uh, PhD students is now uh, in Zurich, but he ran this model and he's showing so ice nucleating particles concentration going across the Atlantic. So this is his 
He's feeding feldspar into the model and running it, and you can see that it's traveling um, across the Atlantic. So we've made measurements here on that side. So now what we want to do is go to the other side of the Atlantic, go to a place called Ragged Point in Barbados, and actually look at the concentrations that are getting on the other side. What's going to happen to the mineral dust? What happens as it tra is transported uh, out in this direction? So here we've got all the data from Cape Verde and all the data from Barbados. And they're very different, if you can see. The amount of... Um, these are all clustered together. So there's, this is more active, higher concentrations of INP, as you'd expect, it's fresh and also different level of activity. So there's obviously something happening as it's transported um, across the Atlantic. We're not entirely sure what that was to start with, but we start to think about what happens in the atmosphere. So if there's some level of cloud processing, the mineral dust goes into a cloud, and then it comes out of the cloud, um, the pH that it's exposed to may change. So as the water evaporates off the surface of the mineral dust, that will change the pH, it will become lower and lower in pH, higher uh, level of acidity, and that could, does that start interacting with the mineral dust? How does that affect um, the activation energy of the mineral dust? Obviously, traveling all that distance, there's potential to be mixed with sea salt, so then you've got another factor coming in, and is that factor, is the sea salt actually diluting the effect of the fresh uh, mineral dust? Or is there actually some chemistry going on? Along the way, is the feldspar preferentially being removed as it's being processed and travelling across? Because it can take some time uh, to travel across the Atlantic. And it doesn't stay all at the same level. It goes up and down with the vagaries um, of the weather. So hopefully, I've sort of, in doing that, I've made you think about what's floating around above your head um, and why it's important and you know, why we need to go out and measure it because we need to understand it. If we're going to put these, all these sorts of things into climate models and convince people to do things, potentially policy makers, you know, politicians have to change um, how things are uh, running, we need to have produced the evidence and have the, having the confidence in it. In the same way that um, there are people running uh, turbulence models these days and turbulence models are used by airlines these days because they will forecast where the turbulence is and then the aircraft are directed to avoid that certain uh, altitude because turbulence is bad for aircraft. It, it means there's more mechanical strain on the aircraft. It alarms the passengers. Nobody likes, you know, screaming in aircraft is not a very good thing. You want to, you want to avoid... Um, that sort of thing. And turbulence is also very, uh, it slows the aircraft down. If an aircraft's bouncing up and down, it's not moving forwards. So if an aircraft can avoid turbulence by using uh, a, a computer model to predict where the turbulence is going to be, it's going to get, it's going to, get to its destination quicker, using, which will use less uh, fuel and less carbon dioxide with happier passengers. And that's what airlines want. So, uh, you know, at that point... You know, people have tested a system, they've produced a robust enough system and tested it against evidence that people are actually going to go and use it, those people being the airlines. So, you know, so we need to understand these things so we can then start to think about who exactly is going to use this and the level of confidence they've got to do with this. Again, uh, just to acknowledge the, uh, the European Association of uh, Geochemistry and uh, my colleagues uh, back at Leeds who've done you know, most of the work that I've just presented. Okay, thank you very much.